Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like her. When the history of struggle for black representation in Britain is written, there will be a whole chapter about my special guest. Baron Woolley of Woodford is a political and equalities activist. Though a peer, he is in fact without peer. He is the founder and director of Operation Black Vote and a trustee of the charity Police Now. He's been an equalities commissioner and has been a crossbench member of the Upper House of Parliament, the House of Lords, since October 2019. He chaired the Government of the UK's Race Disparity Unit advisory group until July 2020. In March 2021, he broke another glass ceiling after he was appointed as the next principal of Homerton College, Cambridge, one of the world's most prestigious universities, but the first black man ever to head a Cambridge college in history. Good morning, Lord Simon Woolley. Good morning to you, my good friend. And what an introduction. It's a good job you can't feel me blushing. <laughs> you could never see me blush. <laughs> But you could feel me blushing with that wonderful introduction. So thank you very much. Well, I have to tell you, it is all fact. Uh, Lord Woody, Simon, you were born yeah. and grew up in a council estate in Leicester. You were raised by adoptive parents, Phyllis and Dan Fox. What yeah. are your memories of your childhood? Very happy, Keith. I have to say that I'm very proud to come from St. Matthew's Estate in Leicester, as you know. And all my friends were working class kids. The former world champion, Chris Pyatt, his brother, Raymond Pyatt, Sabas Dimitro, many of them I'm still friends with today mm. after many, many years. And I was in a home, a very fortunate Keith. I mean, I was in a home full of love. My mother was Welsh, my father Irish, but she wrapped me with love. And at a time when racism was really beginning to rear its head with skinhead uh, on the street, I do remember to this day seeing a Sikh man being bashed to the floor and blood coming from his turban and I was as a eight-year-old child nine-year-old child struck by that level of violence and mm. the skinhead wreaked fear into me and others but you know we learned how to fight we learned how to look after ourselves we learned how to duck and dive so to speak uh, I don't know whether I've said it before but I used to be a ticket tout at Filbert Street <laughs> buying buying tickets from the youth players mm. of Gary Lineker's ilk and then reselling mm. them. So we were working class, but, but we knew how to look after ourselves. Uh, I, I would mm. give money to my mum. And that was our upbringing. Our upbringing was to be smart, to be savvy. Now, you left your council estate. You left school, in fact, even though you're now going to head a Cambridge college without A-levels. You yeah. worked as an apprentice, as a car mechanic. You then moved to London. At the age of 19, you started in advertising for the rank organisation in Wardour Street. But you carried on with your education. You studied Spanish in politics at Middlesex University. You then went to spend some time in Costa Rica, finally earning a master's degree in Hispanic literature at Queen Mary University in London. Why did you choose that particular path or was that path basically thrust upon you? Well, part of it was thrust upon me. I mean, I, when children of my era left school, but university was never on the radar case. Apprenticeships were, and I liked cars, and so I was happy to be a car mechanic. Although in the end, I didn't like getting my hands dirty. <laughs> so when an opportunity to go to the bright lights of London, I went a bit like Dick Whittington looking for fame and fortune. And I worked for Rank Film selling those rubbish ads on the cinema. And then I went to Cambridge, actually, to sell to the local mm. cinema. And, and that's when I fell in love with education. I think in part, Keith, I probably felt a little bit inferior. But mm. although at 21, 22, I had my own property and I was doing well at a company car, I looked at Cambridge, I looked at those kids on the bikes and thought, oh my gosh, they must look down on me, which is mm. totally wrong from my perspective. But what it meant was, he said, I, I said to myself, I want to know what they know. And so I went back to my boss at Ranked Films and said, could I do the, my work part-time and study? And he said, no, Simon, you're a great salesman, one of our best. You'll have mm. to choose studying or be the top salesman. And I took my company car keys out my pocket and threw them the keys and said, I'm done and embarked on this new journey. Simon Woolley, unlike many others, you engaged in British politics by yeah. joining groups from outside Parliament. The first group you joined was Charter 88. Where did you hear about all these groups and why did you become active in right. the movement outside Parliament? Well, having studied Spanish literature and Hispanic 
politics and having lived in places like Costa Rica and particular Colombia and Guatemala. Keith, I saw people literally dying for their beliefs. So it was no longer theory. This was for real. Bombs were going off. Countries were waging in civil war. Mm. And when I came back, I thought, you know, Keith, there's no excuse why I cannot roll my sleeves up and play my part. And so I think one day I saw, I saw an ad in Time Out and people were looking Charge rate here, we're looking for volunteers. And so I joined them. And what I saw with this organization, Keith, was the first time in my life in which a, an organic organization believed that they could change the world, that by democratic reform, lives would be transformed. And that was transformative in of itself, that there were other ways than war in which you could change your lot. Mm. What I also found too was that these organizations were very white. They never got race. So when by chance, literally by chance, I bumped into Lee Jasper at York Hall uh, when him and and Ken Livingston were launching the National Association Against Racism. But we started chatting, I knew of him as a black hero. And he said, you and I will do great things mm. together. And some years later, we launched Operation Black Vote. This is Keith Vaz on Like Radio 1458, talking to the principal-elect of Homerton College, Cambridge, the first black man who will head a Cambridge college. Join us after the break when we'll be talking about Operation Black Vote. <laughs> Like a radio channel sponsor, Tilda Rice. Celebrating 50 years, thanks to you. Like a radio. Mom, have you bought some of those delicious noodles? You mean Coca, the king of noodles? Coca means delicious. Variety of flavors available in Coca packet, Coca cup, and Coca bowl noodles. Suitable for vegetarians and halal approved. The king of noodles, Coca noodles, packets, cups, and bowls, now available everywhere in the UK. Everyone can now get free rapid COVID-19 tests twice a week. They show your results within 30 minutes. They also show you're doing what you can to protect your loved ones, your friends, your workmates, and that you want to keep life moving again. Around one in three people who have COVID-19 have no symptoms and are spreading it without knowing. That could be a friend, a relative, a workmate. It could even be you. Rapid tests are easy to get from nhs.uk forward slash get tested. Let's take this next step safely. What's Kenyan Chevra? Made by Bharti Ben of Nairobi is here. Available at your local Asian supermarket. Trade inquiries. JDM distributors. 07525 345 520. We're here to put a spring back into your business. Leica Media with two powerful Asian stations across London. Feel the impact with Leica Radio and Dilsey Radio. Special spring offers available now. Call 0207 132 1458 or email sales at leicamedia.co.uk today. We're here for you. The personalities that matter with Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like a radio. Welcome back. This is Keith Vaz on Like Radio 1458. I'm talking to Lord Simon Woolley, the first black man who will head a Cambridge college. Lord Woolley, in 1996, you started to research the potential impact of the black vote, which you said could influence the electoral outcomes in marginal seats. Mm -hmm. You then founded Operation Black Vote. The ESME Foundation estimated that your work at OBV encouraged millions of people to vote. Was it a case of just getting black people out to vote or was there a bigger agenda to ask them who they're going to vote for? Well, you make a very good point, Keith, because Operation Black Vote was born in no small measure because black men were going into police custody fit and well and coming out in body bags. And uh, rather than tear our streets down, which was our normal modus operandi when nobody was held to account, is that some of us sat around the table and said, we need political power where we can be in a position where we're not asking for justice, but demanding it. But we felt shockingly powerless. You know, how can our voting make a difference? Mm. I spent nine months doing the research and had a eureka moment when I brought Lee Jasper, Rita Patel, also from Leicester Councillor Rita Patel 25 years ago, Dave Weaver, Ashok Vizwanathan into a room for that showdown in which mm. I said to them, I've got the evidence that far from being powerless, we're fantastically powerful because where we reside in urban conurbations, if you like, that we can decide, I think back then, 70 seats. John Major had a working majority, as you'll remember, of mm. about 20 odd seats, 26 seats. So we could translate that if we registered to vote and voted, we could decide the election. Now, 
Now, that 1997 election was a historic for many, many reasons, not least uh, your government, Tony Blair, won by a huge majority. So we couldn't necessarily say it was the black vote, but we burst onto the stage. Jack Straw on an Operation Black Vote platform promised the Stephen Lawrence public inquiry if black people vote for them. So we knew we had clout. But I mm. recognised, Keith, that it wasn't just about voting where power lay. And so, you know, think about this. 25 years ago, we had a 20-year strategy that will be predicated on three pillars. Political education, understanding how power works, where it lies. Political participation, voter registration and voter turnout. And equally important, political representation. Anywhere there are decisions that affect our lives, we must be at the table. And it's mm. these three pillars that have guided Operation Black Vote for the past 25 years. And you'll know that when we began, and you were one of those few MPs, four in fact, uh, four MPs now were over 60. So the trajectory, the power of the black vote has become part of the British political DNA. Now, there's an argument, uh, not advanced by me, that Operation Black Vote and other organisations have actually failed. You talk about the success of representation, I'm going to ask you a question about that. But we've got Black Lives Matters now. People are still taking the knee. Black men are still dying in custody. And you started this over a quarter of a century ago. What do you say to the critics that Mm. it's not moved fast enough and we're still talking about the same things we did a quarter of a century ago. Well, they'd be right to say it's not moved fast enough, but it has moved. That we, for a long time, this country has been the leading light in, in global race equality. We've been the first nation, democratic nation, to have a race disparity unit. The mm-hmm. thing is this, is that we're dealing with infrastructures, institutions that have been predicated on black and brown people being less than for about 500 years. The enslavement of Africans, the colonization of half the planet, and then extreme racism. And so through all that history, the institutions that we have today have been predicated what went on in the past. And so mm. undoing that will not be a walk in the park and will not happen with a turn of a sixpence. But progress is made. And what I like about last year has been the second iteration of the civil rights movement in which Black Lives Matters, hundreds of thousands of young, predominantly black, but not exclusively black and white young people have taken to the streets, not to, again, ask for justice, but to demand it. And, you know, now I think that those entities outside of government, academic institutions, uh, businesses are saying, if Black Lives Matter is to mean anything, what do I need to do? And that's a good conversation to be having. I think, sadly, we have a government that is probably, probably full square against this progress, which is a tragedy, frankly, at a time when we could easily make the biggest progress in British history. This is Keith Ayers talking to Lord Simon Woolley, the principal-elect of Homerton College, Cambridge. When we come back, we're going to talk about his work in government. Join us after the break.
Pacifica Radio channel sponsor, Tilda Rice. Celebrating 50 years, thanks to you. Like a radio. 650 people a minute, 39,000 people an hour, 460,000 people every day. Join the millions already vaccinated. The COVID-19 vaccine protects you and those around you. And remember, you need two doses for maximum protection. Every vaccination gives us hope. The NHS will let you know when your vaccine is ready for you. Here are foods, the finest ingredients for the master chef in you. With an array of spices, lentils, rice, nuts, flowers and spice mixes to choose from. Whether you're cooking vegan, veg or non-veg, you're sure to find delicious Hira ingredients for your kitchen creations. Hira Foods, king in quality, king in taste. Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like her. Welcome back. This is Keith Vaz on Lyca Radio 1458. I'm talking to the first black man who will ever head a Cambridge University college. That's Lord Simon Woolley. Simon, you worked at the heart of government as the chair of the Race Disparity Unit. What did you see when you got there? And of course, this is not the first. Theresa May appointed you, but she wasn't the first prime minister that you dealt with. I want to put you on the spot and ask you, of all the prime ministers you've worked with, of all the political leaders at that level, who is the most responsive? I think she was. I think she was the most humble on this agenda. There was an Achilles heel with uh, former Prime Minister Theresa May. That was immigration. Uh, I think that she sought to bring down the numbers and took her eye off the ball that my mother's generation were caught up in those immigration figures tragically under Windrush. And I've never sought to defend her on that. But in regards to structural racism, regards to stop and search, that she was one of our greatest champions. And I think a bit like Lord McPherson 20 years ago, who acknowledged institutional racism, he did so, Keith, because he was able to listen, acknowledge and accept people's lived experiences. Fast forward 20 years, Theresa May sat down with me and she said, I'm listening, I understand, I get it. What do I need to do? Mm. Now, you were around, of course, very active when the CRE was abolished. No one suggesting for one moment that the CRE was the most perfect organisation in the world. But do you think that was a mistake, taking away an organisation that just spoke for black people and replacing it as part of a strand of the Equalities Commission where all these disadvantaged groups were put together? Was that a mistake? It was a huge mistake. And we vociferously fought your government not to go down that path, the kind of one-size-fits-all fits nobody. You have to bear in mind now when the Commission for Racial Equality, particularly under the great Lord Herman Oosley, there were about 50 satellite local race equality groups, organisations that were feeding into the whole, that were feeding Mm. in local concerns and they're all disbanded. And then you had the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which had lofty agenda but couldn't really deliver on the beacon of race equality as did the Commission. And now I'm afraid I think it's been used as a political tool has been deeply politicized and it has little or no respect amongst black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, which is a great tragedy because a lot of its infrastructure could still very much hold to account those institutions and businesses that do not deliver on race equality. Now, on your remarkable journey, one of the initiatives that you launched was the annual survey called the Colour of Power. Why did you think that that was necessary? Well, I'd seen something in the States in 2016 around Oscar's so white. And the New York Times had a a look at actually where they thought power lie, but in the culture and the arts section. And I looked at that, Keith, and I said, we can do better than that. Mm. And so I worked with our team and established this format, the color of power, that looked at 28 different sectors of our society. In fact, who runs our country in all areas, at all levels. And we took 28 areas, such as law, publishing, politics, medical, hospitals, right across the board and took 1,034 of those individuals that in effect run our country and found that less than 3% were black, Asian, minority, ethnic. So all white at the top, virtually. Mm. Now, you're now in the Lords. You can make laws, whereas before you were outside lobbying, now people lobby you. Have you enjoyed your time there? I know it's been at a time when we've had the pandemic, but Parliament Mm -hmm. has still carried on. You're a crossbencher peer, so that means that you're not taking instructions 
than some Labour or Conservative. Is it what you expected it to be? It's everything that I expected and more. It's a wonderful place. It's, a, it's just the most tremendous building. But unlike your former chamber, the House of Commons, which is brutally tribal, and anyone that opens their mouth on one side, the other side almost have to disagree. <laughs> uh, there's, a different, there's a different element in the upper chamber. People are not thinking about their next role or whether or not they'll be deselected. And so you have the opportunity to have a greater collegiate conversation. I think that I've come in at an unfortunate time in which the government have a huge majority, and so they don't much care about what the Lords say, but the public do, the institutions do, and that's important. And when I took on this wonderful role at Homerton, I did say to them that I still want to be in the House of Lords, I still want to be reasonably mm. active, although my priority is with this wonderful institution, Homerton. Mm. Uh, it's great. I feel a bit odd sometimes when the staff turn around and say, my Lord, my Lord, would you like this? And I'm thinking, who are they talking to? <laughs> 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 well, we'll, we're, <laughs> we're going to come on to this incredible appointment at Homerton College, Cambridge, in our final section. This is Keith Vaz on Like a Radio. After I talk to Lord Simon Woolley, I will be chatting to Fizz Ascari and Zoya Sheikh about their Eid celebrations and also about the situation in Palestine. And after the news, we're off to Wales to talk to the first ethnic minority woman elected to the Welsh Assembly, Natasha Asgar MS. Finally, we'll be Popping over to the United States of America to talk to the mayor of Clinton, Janice Kovach, about the COVID situation there. Join me again shortly. that matter with Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like a radio. This is Keith Vaz on Like a Radio 1458 talking to Lord Simon Woolley. Simon, your appointment as the next principal of Homerton College, Cambridge, made headlines all yeah. over the world. The first black head of a Cambridge college. Why did you seek this challenge? Well, it sought me in many ways. I was asked if I wanted to apply. I was kind of flattered. 
but with some trepidation. I mean, this is, these two universities are the oldest in the world uh, with great history and great prestige. But I thought to myself, why not me? I have a good backstory. I have a vision that is progressive, that is inclusive, that is dynamic. And surely 21st century Britain ought to be able to accommodate somebody that has my backstory and journey. And lo and behold, it fitted with the values of the fellows who elect you and the heartbeat of this wonderful college that wanted to be seen as modern, progressive, inclusive, and with a fighting spirit. I mean, Homerton comes from the East End, the East End of London, with all the challenges the East End of London have had over centuries. And now that's in Cambridge, and they feel that I embody lots of that ambition for excellence, but inclusivity. Mm. Now, when they talk about Oxford and race, they always point out to the fact that there is a need to get more black students into Oxbridge. Actually, I've been looking up the figures and it seems the latest figures show that black, Asian and minority ethnic students account for 34.36% of first year undergraduates, which is actually quite a good total. It's certainly above the percentage in the population. Why is this such a focus for the media and others in respect of the number of black students? Well, when you consider, Keith, when you were a minister and you would look around the, the, the cabinet table or you'd look at the FTSE 100 businesses, that many of them would come from Oxford or Cambridge and many of them would be almost exclusively white. So get in the upper echelons of our education institutions representative is a key challenge not just for the academic institutions but also our broader society and so it's right that there should be this push i mean there are still few too few black professors fellows head teachers in schools but this is a trajectory that is in the right direction and i hope that i can be a beacon you know for kids on st matthews or beaumont lees or the other working class estates in leicester and beyond because you know when you are drive and excellence, then you should have a pathway to the best institutions in the country. Mm. But Cambridge has been there since 1209 as a university. It's the third oldest university in the world. And and you've been around for 60 years. It's going to be quite a challenge, isn't it? Changing the thinking around admissions. Well, you know, I'm like you, Keith, but no challenge is, is bigger than we can confront. And we're used to challenges. And I think that if you've got a good team around you, and I no longer have the imposter syndrome, about why me? I can't do this. I'm thinking, when do I start? And how big, mm. how broad, how dynamic can I believe? And I think that I've already tried to instill this with a leadership team at Homerton, and they're just embracing it. Fellow students, past students that have also come to me and say, how can they lean into it? It is a tremendous moment. And I think that if Homerton can be a beacon, I would hope that other colleges will follow suit on this wonderful trajectory. But also the link is not just about what the students do in the college. It's even more important about what they do when they leave. Mm. Now, for a rebel, for someone who's always prodding the establishment, you have been lavished with honours from the establishment. I can't remember a single individual who got a knighthood and a peerage in the same year. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think think they're trying to buy you off, Simon Woolley? Well, look, here's here's the point about it. For 25 years, I headed an organisation in a thankless role, utterly thankless, uh, with low salary, always. Lee Jasper, who was the the founder of Operation Blackbird, said to me, Simon, this is thankless. Understand it and accept it. And that has been my mantra for all these years. Um, And I've been fine with that. But in the 25th year, not one bus, two buses, but like five buses showed up. (laughs) (laughs) And look, I, I think that we also have to say too is don't be such a a shrinking violet or overwhelmed with humility that you cannot accept a pat on the back when it comes. But mm. at every time it's happened, I've always said it's not about me, it's about what I and others do. Mm. And I think if you, like you, you've been driven to change. And again, like you, because I've known you for many years, Keith, is that you wake up in the morning thinking, how can I change our world? And that's a mm. great privilege and a great feeling that you can be part of that because too many people, things are done to them. And we often complain in the, in the hairdressers or the barber shops. But what our grand plan is to give them to tools to say, actually, that we can push back. We can build better. It's not building back better, as some of the politicians would have us believe, but build new better. As far as race is concerned, and this is my final question to you, yeah. what do you want for your young son compared to what you had to face in the area of race you know, 50 mm. years ago? I know it's a cliche, but it's really Dr. King's dream that um, I'm proud of his, he's proud of his heritage, but I want, to, I want him to be seen by the content of his character, uh, not just by the color of his beautiful skin. 
And I think that I want that for my children, for your children, and for all your listeners' children. And if I can be part of that change, I, I feel like I'm one of the most privileged people on the planet. I have to say, Simon, you make me want to go back to university again and apply immediately <laughs> for courses <laughs> from <Robinson> College, Cambridge. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be accepting mature students. They, you have a lot. But I, I would have thought that we would have been asking you to be a fellow and bring some of your worldly wisdom to this great establishment. Lord Simon Woolley, Principal-Elect of Homerton College, Cambridge, it's been fascinating talking to you. We always ask our special guests to choose a song that is special to them and dedicated to someone very important to them. What is the song that you have chosen? Well, if you can find this, I've chosen a song called by Banco Matt, and it's called One Day, and it's a modern song with a Martin Luther King twist. If you can find it, then wonderful, because it's just everything. It's about hope, it's about dancing, it's about, it's about us. And I want to dedicate it to my mother, who gave me everything in regards to love and hope. I've been very lucky. I've had two wonderful mothers, and I love them both. But the one that gave me so much opportunity and, and love, I want to dedicate this to her. Simon, thank you very much for joining us today. This is Like a Radio, the greatest radio station in the world. So we will find this song. Whatever we have to do, we will find this song. And the best of luck to you on your new and exciting challenge. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Keith. It's been a great pleasure. And best wishes to everybody on Like Radio, your listeners and beyond. This is wonderful. Now let's hear... Simon Woolley's song. I have a dream. One day, one day, one day, one day, one day. This nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are free. One day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slaves will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? Slaves and the 